So once again, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, as Martin mentioned, we'll be talking about the National Cathedral in Ghana, um, which was proposed by the current president, and then the state involvement in the organization of Hajj, that um, Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. And we reflect on this, on how it expressed or depicts the complexities of the relationship between religions and state in Ghana. And then we also look at how that, what that means for Christian Muslim relations in Ghana. So yes, just to say first, um, say thanks once again to the Center for Muslim Christian Studies um, and also the Sana Institute for this opportunity. And um, I must say that what I'm sharing now is a work in progress of a research paper. So your questions and your feedback is, would be very helpful in moving forward. By way of outline, we'll first look at briefly a portrait of Ghana, at least for the benefit of those who do not know much about Ghana. And then we'll outline some of the issues, the controversies and the debates that came out of the um, issue of the National Cathedral and the Hajj. And then we'll try to look into those issues and bring out some probing questions. And then we'd want to reflect on these issues from the lenses of Lamin Sanen's uh, piety and power. And we would also look at the Supreme Court declaration on these issues. And then lastly, we'll look at the implications of all these for Christian Muslim relations in Ghana. So for those who may not be familiar with um, um, the African terrain. Ghana is in the West Africa at the um, southern coast of West Africa and um, flanked by a number of um, French speaking countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, and Beni. And we are also not far, to, not too far, so to say, from Nigeria. The two main religions in Ghana are Christianity and Islam. And there are, there are others, African traditional religion and um, other Eastern religions as well. But Christianity and Islam are the two main religions. And Islam is the first to have arrived um, non-indigenous religion to enter modern day Ghana in the 15th century. As you can see on the slide, that's the Dar Larabanga Mosque, which was built in 1421, so that should tell you how far, um, how early Islam entered um, modern day Ghana. After Islam then came Christianity. Uh, the history books say that there were some initial attempts but sustained Christian mission in Ghana actually started in the 19th century um, by the Basel missionaries. And the chapel you see there is one of the first chapels they, they built, the Christ Church in Ekropo in the eastern region of Ghana. So just to say that um, Ghana, in terms of religion, we would say is a, plural, um, a pluralistic um, country in terms of religion. But then there are these two dominant religions, as we look at further. Christianity is in the majority, but the last population census, um, the indication is that Christians are about 71% and Muslims are 15%. And um, the rest made up of those who say they do not belong to any religion and others who belong to the African traditional religion and other um, religions. So now let's move, having done this, uh, preliminary introduction, let's move to the main issue uh, for today. In 2017, when the current president of Ghana first took office as the president, he indicated that he would want to have a national cathedral built for the country. And um, this was going to be located at one of the prime locations 
where we have a lot of state facilities, where we have the parliament house, where we have the state house, where we have the international conference center. And the point is that this is going to complement in his own words, what is missing within that enclave, um, the symbol, what depicts our identity and our, um, our society. This was, this cathedral um, is going, it's, it's not just going to be a chapel or something of that sort, but it's, it's, it involves a whole lot of things. The plan is to have a main conference hall and to have other conference centers. And there are also some worship centers, youth centers, children's centers, classrooms and seminar halls, a Bible museum, and then um, a biblical garden. So even though um, that proposal or the announcement of this initiative was received with mixed action by the populace, but many of the people were actually not in favor of that idea. And we'll come back to look at some of the arguments that were raised against it. But then on the eve of the 60th anniversary, Ghana gained independence in 1957. So um, 2017, sixth March 2017 was the 60th independence anniversary. So the day before this anniversary celebration, the president um, laid the foundation stone for the um, building of this national cathedral. Uh, and as you can see in the picture, he laid the stone with several um, dignitaries there. And the picture on the right, the president seated. Um, and on his right is the vice president, who is actually a Muslim, and then also the wife of the vice, the second lady, the wife of the vice president, who is also a Muslim. And on his left is um, the late um, Dr. Entry Santi, who was a presiding bishop of the Methodist Church. And so this ceremony was attended not only by the religious Christian community, but there were state officials and also even people from um, the Muslim community, as you can see the um, vice president himself present. So with the um, foundation stone laid, um, the project was not going to see any return. It was going to progress and yet the controversies and the debate about it uh, ensued. Now, the main source of concern is the communication from the state, from the government, with regard to the purpose, the intention, and the justification for this cathedral. It's not been consistent. Um, every now and then, one reason or the other is pushed forward as a justification for the, uh, the building of this cathedral. And so there are several of them, but I would want us to look at um, three of the arguments or that were advanced by the president when this, um, the foundation stone was being laid in his speech. He indicated some key reasons why he thinks this cathedral is very important. So we'll look at three of these um, reasons that he indicated, and we'll also look at the responses that uh, have been given to those um, propositions. One of them is this, is, and the president said in his statement, since gaining our freedom from the colonial power 63 years ago on 6 March 1957, Ghana has so far been spared civil war, famine, and epidemics. We are certainly no better than the other nations in our nationhood who have been confronted with these challenges. I believe it is by the grace of God that we have been preserved and sustained. The construction of the National Cathedral will be an act of thanksgiving to the almighty God for his blessings, grace, favor, mercies on our, and mercies on our nation. So one of the main reasons for the president in initiating this um, project is to give thanks to God, to, to appreciate God's favor, God's protection and us as a country. Um, since independence, the challenges that we've gone through, 
which according to him, relatively, it's not been as bad if we compare to our neighbors. So this is an opportunity to give thanks to God for being with us as a country. Indeed, God has been good to us as a country and we ought to be thankful, even though we've had um, some unstable political regime in the early years after independence, but then we have always found a way out. And since 1992, we've had a very stable and progressive um, democracy. So it wouldn't be out of place for us as a country to say we are giving thanks to God. But the question is, which God are we referring to here? How about the God of the Muslims? If you are building a cathedral, then you are building it to the God, perhaps the God of the Christians. But we, we, we also bear in mind that as a country, we are not made up of only Christians. There are other religions. There are the Muslims, there are the traditionalists, there are that. And these various religions, their own conception and understanding of God and what God expects of us as an act of appreciation and act of worship is not the same as it is from the Christian perspective. So if you say as a country, we are thanking God and our way of doing it is to build a cathedral, then the question is, which God, to which God are you building this cathedral? Is it just the Christian God? And if it is the Christian God, then how about the others? And for Christians, it's also the case, um, which some have um, advanced, that for Christians, our understanding is that God does not really live in buildings. And so if we want to appreciate him, perhaps the best way of appreciating him is with our lifestyle and not necessarily erecting a building unto him. And indeed, the president acknowledged this in one of his subsequent addresses um, in what, during one of the fundraising ceremonies for the National Cathedral. He did indicate that, that like, he, if I will quote him, like Solomon, he, he does acknowledge that God does not live in buildings, and yet it is appropriate for us to build the cathedral in appreciation of him. And some would still say that, okay, how do you build, how do you build a cathedral to honor God when our very corrupt lives, especially among the ruling class, does not honor God? So are we honoring God with our lives and in buildings and yet our own lifestyle does not show that kind of appreciation, honor and respect to God? So to some people, this is not an act that is truly, is in its um, proper sense consistent, even with the Christian faith. And so this is not something that the state should consider putting state funds into doing. So that's just one of the um, arguments or the, the reasons and their purpose that the president has advanced as um, motivating the construction of this project. The other one he said is to give him the opportunity to redeem a pledge he made to God before he became the president. So the, the, the point is, the indication is that Yes, the president has been yearning to become a president for a very long time. Um, since 2000, if I remember well, 2004 or so. Um, and so it's been a long journey for him. It was until 2016 that he finally got the nod, got elected to become a president. So the indication in, is that in this process, he made a pledge to God that if he helped him to become a president, he would build a cathedral to, to, to honor him. Now, for us Christians, this wouldn't be something that is inconsistent with scripture or with our faith, because in scripture, in Bible, in the Bible, we see a lot of personalities who made personal pledges to God and as a way of um, honoring God, they honored that uh, promise, they redeemed the pledge. So if we are to look at it from a Christian perspective, then the act of the president in initiating the building of the cathedral 
in appreciation or in redeeming a pledge which he made to God, it can only be a commendable act when it comes to Christian spirituality. Because for Christians, when you, you, are, you are encouraged that when you make a pledge, when you make a promise, you redeem it. But the big question is, how do you redeem a personal pledge using state resources and privileges? Because yes, as a president, you've made your pledge and there is nothing wrong with you redeeming that pledge. But then from all indication, there, there is going to be involvement of state funds and state resources in building the cathedral. So if the aim is to redeem a personal pledge, how then do you mobilize state resources to redeem a personal pledge? The response has always been that this is not something that the state is going to use state funds to, to, to build. And indeed, in one of the fundraising activities in the president's address, he did indicate that he didn't want this project to be a burden on the state. And on his own, on his own, he pledged, I think, 100,000 cities or so towards um, the funds that were being raised to build the cathedral. But the point is, the cathedral is going to be sited on a prime land, state land, and it's going to be on a 14-acre state land. And if this land is to be sold, it's a lot of money. So that alone is an indication of state fund going or state resources going into it. And aside from that, proud to the commencement of this cathedral project, this land had a number of government buildings, even bungalows for judges sited on this land. And to make way for the cathedral, they had to pull down all these houses. So if you value all these houses that had to be pulled down together with the cost of the land, that's a lot of money going into it. And to many people, it's not just that, but the state involvement in fundraising activities, even at a point the, um, the secretariat of the cathedral board was at, had their offices at the seat of presidency um, at a point. So to many people, it cannot be the case that the cathedral is not a burden on state resources because already the land to start with is coming from the state and um, all uh, many other resources and interventions indicate that the state some way somehow is putting in some resources. So that's the second point. The third one um, which the president um, made, which you would want to look at is he said, 71% of the Ghanaian people adhere to the Christian religion grouped under the various persuasions of the Christian faith. The interdenominational national cathedral will help unify the Christian community and thereby help promote national unity and social cohesion. So for the president, um, initiating this project one is to help unify the um, various Christian denominations and also to promote national unity and social cohesion. Now, indeed, there are a lot of Christianity is the majority religion in the country and the church has contributed a lot to development of the um, nation in provision of education, health, social services in various ways. So it may not be out of place to want to also give back to the church. And it is also true that the church is divided along many denom um, denominations. Um, there are several of them, thousands of them uncountable. Um, and so these different denominations are organized along um, ecumenical bodies. There is the Christian Council of Ghana, the Charismatic Council, and then you have the Catholic Bishops Conference, there is the Charismatic Bishops Conference, and about three or four main um, ecumenical organizations. But there are still several thousands of congregations, denominations, which do not belong to any of these um, ecumenical bodies. But the point is, if building, having a national cathedral 
is something that is so critical for the unity of the church. Is it not the case that the ecumenical bodies of this Christian community can put themselves together and put up this building? And people make reference to several other chapels, cathedrals built by individual churches. And so the point is, if one church can build such huge auditoriums, cathedral, if the Christian community really wants something that will unify them, couldn't they have put their own resources together without the involvement of the state to avoid all these kind of debates and, 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 and issues? The other um, response is that if it is about promoting national unity and social cohesion, how about the other minority faith? So if you are promoting national unity and national cohesion, then you would want to bring on board different dimensions, different segments of the society. So if you are promoting unity and social cohesion along religious lines, then you should do something that would not only satisfy one faith community, but something that is able to link and uh, mobilize all the faith groups together such a way that they, something that is interfaith in nature that they can congregate along and then help promote the kind of um, national unity and social cohesion that the president seemed to um, argue for. So the, 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 the question and the, the, the response is that this is not really something that will promote national unity as the president is, is, is arguing. It's rather helping the Christian community. And if it will, if it will promote any unity at all, it will be for the Christian community. And this was the concern of the Muslim community as well. Sheikh Arumi Al Shaibu is the spokesperson of the National Chief Imam. And this, this, this were some of his responses, speaking on behalf of the Chief Imam and the segment of the Muslim community. He said, the context is that, okay, you are a secular country, the National Christian Cathedral will just give certain image or monument to satisfy only one session of the citizenry. If you do so, you sometimes create a foundation for certain kind of conflict. So to him, instead, uh, the, whilst the president is ad, ad, uh, arguing that the National Cathedral will promote national unity, to the spokesperson of the National Chief Imam, the National Cathedral is rather going to serve as a focus for conflict, the religious conflict. Because if you are doing this for just one religious community, how about the other? So he recommends that whatever edifice will be put up should serve both religions, not one. If it is in respect of the 60th independence anniversary, is the independence for one section of the country or for the whole of the country. So this comes back to the point that was made earlier that if, if we are doing this as part of the landmark project to mark the 60th anniversary, the independence was not fought only by Christians. And the country at the moment is also not made up of only Christians. So if you want to do something to mark 60th anniversary of independence, then it should be something that is really interfaith in nature and not just something that satisfies one religious community. But before um, the Muslim community and leaders could push this debate or argument further, one would then remind them of other areas that the state has also advanced support to the cause of the Muslim community. If you would want to relate it to the National Cathedral, then one that immediately comes to mind is the National Mosque, which is also under construction. This is a picture of it taken some months ago. Um, also, the central part of Accra is a very huge mosque, um, which has some funding also from some Turkish organizations. And the point is that the land on which this mosque is situated, the, the indication is that it was also given by the government. So if same is done for the Christian community, why um, the concern? What's the big deal about it? But the Muslim community would also tell you that no, we have to go back into history. Several years back during the military regime era, there used to be a national mosque at one of the central business areas in Accra now, uh, Makola, we call it Makola. And the then head of state um, 
got the sent the mosque pulled down and their place is now used for a car park. So to them, the state giving this land to them is a compensation for that mosque that was pulled down several years back to make way for the construction of the, the car park to accommodate vehicles that come to the central business center. So to them, this is not something that can be compared to the state support for the National Cathedral. But beyond that, um, not one area that the state advanced support to the Muslim community, which is, can be more comparable to how the National Cathedral is being run, is the organization of Hajj. Since independence time, the um, state has been involved in the organization of the Muslim pilgrimage. There is a National Hajj board which operation is largely funded by the state. And from um, all indications, the state also some way, somehow, also support um, the pilgrimage and those who, the pilgrims, those who go on their pilgrimage uh, financially and through other means. And this, this statement you, you see on the slide, where from the um, Hard Board Chairman um, trying to give account of how things went in 2009. And he said, um, when briefing the press at the Thanksgiving session organized by the board, chairman of the Hajj board, Sheikh Isikwe said, the provision of free medical health screening by the medical team of the Pilgrims Affairs Office of Ghana, protection by peacekeeping security men and women and free meals by the committee were all available without additional cost to the Pilgrim. According to him, this can be attributed to the decision by the government to raise hard corporations to the national level because it's a national security implication. It's national security implications. The unconditional support offered to the board and the pilgrim by the president Akupadu and his vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Baudnia, was the reason we achieved so much. So this is a testimony from the hard board chairman himself, who is also a Muslim of the um, extent to which the state is involved in supporting and giving resources to support the Hajj operations. So then it becomes a two-way thing. And it's not just this government, as I indicated, this is something that started long ago. And if you can see on the left, um, that's a Hajj village constructed close to the airport on the, one of the prime land in Accra where people from different um, regions in the country who want to embark on Hajj, they first congregate there for some days for processing of their travel documents or the other before they bought the flight to Mecca for their pilgrimage. And as you can see on the board there, the flag up there is the flag of the party that was in power, I think as at 2012 when this Hajj village was constructed. So the state does not only render support to the Muslim community in these ways, but for them, it's also a source of um, political capital to make political capital out of it, to say that who is doing this better and who is much more concerned about the interests of the Muslim community. So now we've seen that it's not only about the National Cathedral, um, but it's something that the state also does for the Muslim community. And the question is, why is it that governments of Ghana perpetually lament over limited state resources, amidst insatiable developmental needs, and yet prioritize funding of religious activities and initiatives? People lament over a whole lot of things, and um, developmental needs, water, electricity, roads, schools, deplorable things. And yet the state finds no problem with funding what otherwise might be termed purely religious activity like Hajj um, or the construction of um, a, a national cathedral. And so people argue that is the state not concerned about our developmental needs? Why is it that with the glaring challenges and with the limited resources, the state still finds it prudent to commit resources to religious activities. Why is it that in so doing, the state tries to always balance up in their support for the Christian and Muslim communities? 
And why is it that the state is always coy by its support for religious initiatives? As I have indicated, if you look at the kind of communication that comes from the government um, concerning this national cathedral and even had uh, uh, operations, you see a certain attitude of the state not um, being hesitant to indicate clearly the best kind of support that they render for these operations, be it funding of Hajj, the National Cathedral, and even payment of Arabic school teachers. One of the things the government does is that they fund um, the Muslim community have Arabic schools outside the mainstream um, educational system. And the state pays or gives allowance to um, the teachers in some of these Arabic schools. Why is it that in all this, the state is very hesitant to be forthcoming in all this? So these are some three questions that we wanted to um, engage as, as we move on. What are some possible responses? Is it because the state considers the church and most as critical institutions and social partners for effective governance, or the state is concerned about maintaining peaceful religious coexistence? Could it also be that it's for political expediencies. Now, our contention or my contention is that all three potential explanations could be valid or could be the case. And so the proposition is that the entanglement of the Ghanaian state in religious issues can be explained by three factors. One is concern for peaceful coexistence Two is the complexities of a secular state with religious people. And three, what I would call the politics of religion. Um, as I've said, this is a work in progress and when the full paper is done, we'll address all this. But for the sake of time, we only look at the second one, how the complexity of our secular state explains the entanglement of the, um, the government in religious activities. And so let's, look at this from the lenses of um, the late Professor Amin Sane, who in his book, Piety and Power, uh, Muslim and Christians in West Africa, he makes the point that the modern West in its dramatic intrusion in Africa and elsewhere has been a bearer of two massive but uneven influences, one secular and the other religious. The secular influence has expressed itself in the autonomy of the nation state and the religious in the organization and extending of the missionary movement. Both influences have left enduring legacies, a secular elite that maintains and is in turn maintained by the machinery of state bureaucracy and the ecclesiastical jurisdiction that ministers to the flock. And this applies so well to the Ghanaian context such that during the colonial era, the colonial administration the, the, the indirectly or directly rendered support for the cause of both Christianity and Islam. But one may even argue that they even did more for Islam than they might have done for Christianity, where um, Islam entered the country through the northern part and for several decades, it was only at the northern part of the country, whereas Christian missionaries entered through the southern part. There was what one we call the zoning, religious zoning of the country where the colonial authorities thought Islam is the best religion for people in the North and they did not want Christians to um, go there and destroy the social cohesion and the structure there. So they prevented Christian missionaries from moving to the North to the South and uh, from the South to the North. And in return, um, and this is actually in return for what um, in literature, I call the indirect rule policy of the, colo the British colonial authorities, where they rule through leaders of the community. So long as the community does not challenge or interfere in the interest of the colonial authorities. The Muslim communities in the North, um, and good of a number of the communities in the North, they, they are more of a chieftain community. They have chieftaincy systems, and so they are political leaders are the chiefs of, of a sort. But because it was a dominant Islam, a Muslim community, these chiefs also became leaders, not only of the traditional community, but um, also of a religious community. 
And so these colonial authorities rule through them, they collect taxes for them and all that. And in return, the colonial authorities also pre, um, protect their territories and sometimes even help them to expand their territories. And so Christianity couldn't go up north, um, but in the south too, that's not also to say that the colonial authorities do not offer any support for the Christian community. So in both ways, the one could say that the colonial authorities supported the advancement of both Islam and Christianity, but that which they were careful also not to do is to bring religion and the state together. They maintain the idea of having a secular state um, as an extension of the kind of system that prevailed in the West where the state operates and is not to be guided or to, uh, to have one particular national religion but then still render some form of support to the religious community. Lame Sane continues that, however, when applied to Africa, the European formulation of the relation of religion and politics revealed glaring anomalies, the most significant being the lack of indigenous parallel to the Christian presupposition of a late state. So the point is, the colonial um, regime, they have this idea of a secular state, which, is, which still allows religious organizations to operate. But within the indigenous community, um, Ghanaian and African community, the idea of having a secular state, it's some way, somehow, new phenomenon. Because in the traditional system, the chief and the priest, traditional priest, and all those who are in charge of religious affairs, they work hand in hand and they work together. So the idea of separating and drawing a line between the realm of um, um, the secular and then the realm of the sacred is something that is new to the um, Ghanaian. And this is, also, uh, this is also problematic in the fact that the people are very religious um, to their core. And so that has been the, 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 the experience and that has been the state of Ghana in such that um, Daniel, Daniel Foucault has in his typology of relationship between states and religions, he gives um, four um, typologies of the kind of relationship that exists between religions and states. One is conflictual integration, consensual integration, conflictual differentiation and consensual differentiation. If we are to examine the state and the, the situation in Ghana, we would say that um, Ghana, between the flanks of theocracy and atheistic society, the nature of religion and state relations in Ghana is what we would call consensual differentiation, where there is one, a constitutionally a secular state, two, there is autonomous religious groups, but then there is a highly religious people and a national democratic governance system that allows participation of religion. And so how we are able to manage this very idea of a secular state and a religious people, how we are able to manage the idea of a secular state which is not to be controlled by religion or any religious thought, and yet the governors of the country historically has had religious groups contributing significantly to it is something that explains the historical and contemporary entanglement of the state in religious affairs. And this was the explanation of the Supreme Court of Ghana as well. When this issue of the National Cathedral came up um, and people were so upset about it, people speaking against it. One person had the um, confidence to take the issue to court. And um, his contention is that it is unconstitutional for the Republic of Ghana through its organs of government, ministries, agencies, departments, and all authorized representatives to purposely aid, endorse, sponsor, support, offer preferential governmental promotion of and all be excessively entangled in any religion or religious practice. If you read the details of um, the read, um, the, the argument is that 
for the country or the state to provide land for the construction of a national cathedral and every other forms of um, resource that the state has advanced for this cause amounts to excessive entanglement in religious issues. And then as a way of maybe balancing it off, the, they also added in the reach that same applies to the state involvement in the organization of the Hajj pilgrimage. And to him, in doing so, the government or the state is violating the constitution. And his basis uh, is on several aspects of the constitution of Ghana. And one of them is Article 17, to which says that a person shall not be discriminated against on grounds of gender, race, color, ethnic origin, religion, creed, or social or economic status. The other one is um, Article 21, 1, B and C, which says that freedom of thought, conscience, and belief, which shall include academic freedom, freedom to practice any religion and to manifest such practice. So this is talking about the kinds of freedom that the constitution guarantees all citizens. And then the other um, part of the constitution that they are basing on is the Article 35, 1, five, six, and then six A, which states, states that Ghana shall be a democratic state dedicated to the realization of freedom and justice. And accordingly, sovereignty resides in the people of Ghana from whom government derives all its powers and authority through this constitution. The state shall actively promote the integration of the peoples of Ghana and prohibit discrimination and prejudice on the grounds of place of origin circumstances of birth, ethnic origin, gender, or religion, creed, or other beliefs. Towards the achievement of the objective stated in clause five of this article, the state shall take appropriate measures to a foster a spirit of loyalty to Ghana that overrides sectional, ethnic, or other loyalties. The last um, uh, provision in the constitution which they rely on is that uh, is the Article 56, which says, Parliament shall have no power to enact a law to establish or authorize the establishment of a body or movement with a right or power to impose on the people of Ghana a common program or a set of objectives of a religious or political nature. So the argument for the plaintiff in this case is that if you put all these um, clauses and provisions in the constitution together, if you interpret them collectively and even independently, the, by providing land for the National Cathedral and also funding hard, hard operations, the government is violating these aspects of the constitution. And that also amounts to unnecessary entanglement of the state in religion. And so they invited the, um, the Supreme Court to declare this act of the government to be unconstitutional and stop the support of the government for the construction of the National Cathedral and also the funding of the Hajj operations. But the Supreme Court in his ruling says, and this was a unanimous decision, we do not find any ambiguity in the above constitutional provisions which are clear and unambiguous. So to them, um, for a Supreme Court, their work is to interpret aspects of the constitution which seem to be unambiguous, which is, deep, which is not clear, which is not straightforward. But all the provisions that the plaintiff indicated to them, these have no ambiguity and they are clear. They are clear saying what? They are clear saying that the country is a secular state the country shall promote freedom of religion and the country shall avoid discrimination against people on any religious grounds. And to them, they went further to say that they do not see the act of the government in providing land for the National Cathedral and funding the Hajj to be in violation of any of these um, provisions in the constitutions in the first place. And secondly, it does not amount to excessive entanglement by the state um, as the plaintiff is, is, is um, 
arguing. So fundamentally, the Supreme Court is saying there is no problem. There is nothing wrong with the state supporting religious activities to that extent. And one interesting thing in the ruling of the state is they make, um, they allude also to the fact that the plaintiff would have a case if there should be any other minority religious group, maybe a traditional religion also requesting, for instance, um, the state for a land or something support, and that is not done as has been done to the others, then perhaps there can be a case for violation of these provisions in the constitution. But as it stands now, whatever the government is doing is in its rightful place. And in further, um, to support the decision of the, the, the ruling of the court, they allude to the same things which um, was said earlier in Lamin Sane also made um, mention of um, in terms of explaining um, how Christians and Muslims, not only in Ghana, but within the West African religion, they are able to intermingle and work with the, the, the state. And this is what they said, that the, the constitution of the fourth republic, which is the constitution that the country is using now, while secular in nature, affirms and maintains the historical, cultural, and religious or effaced character of the Ghanaian society. So for them, even though we may have what we call constitutional secularism, um, the constitution affirms the history, culture, and the religious aspirations of the people. And then they go further, this is even more critical to explain that obviously secularism in the context of Ghana constitution must be understood to allow and even encourage state recognition and accommodation of religion and religious identity. So this is where the, the point is that the idea of secularism as um, the Supreme Court has explained as the constitution of Ghana seeks to provide for, is not to mean that really the state should um, take a back seat or move itself away from religion, but it's rather, it actually means that the state should be able to support and, and recognize and support religious groups as part of the identity of the country. And the court code goes ahead to state that the plaintiff alleges the setting up of a board of trustees with the office at the Jubilee House. Jubilee House is the seat of government. To coordinate and construct the National Cathedral is an example of the government crossing an impermissible line in relationship between the state and religion. And the Supreme Court says, we do not see this act as an excessive entanglement. And then they go further to explain that historically the state in Ghana recognized the existence and importance of religious identity and affiliation um, in the Ghanaian society and encouraging and courage their open and lawful expression of state. So it's also alluding to the contribution of the religious groups um, where the churches and the Muslim communities, they have schools, a number of the good schools in Ghana now were originally started by the churches and later the Muslim groups and the same applies to some medical facilities, especially in the rural areas. So to the, to the Supreme Court, to the extent that the religious groups are able to participate in governance and support the development of the country in these areas, it wouldn't be out of place for the state to also return back in supporting issues that are of interest to the religious committee. And they further go ahead to explain certain things that the church has done in the past. So what are the implications of all this for Christian Muslim relations? Three things um, quickly to, to we, we can glean from this, that Christian Muslim relations in Ghana and perhaps in other areas always has a third critical person, which is the state so that um, Christians, may, Christians and Muslims may have their theological debate and all those things, but the main points of contention are mainly within um, the public sphere, the public space. And these are, the public space is moderated or it's governed by the state. And so to the extent that the state is involved in this public space, Christian-Muslim relation in Ghana, and I want to assume elsewhere, always has the state as a critical um, leg. And so to discuss issue of Christian-Muslim relation cannot be complete 
without discussing the relationship between religion and, and state and religion and, and, and politics. The third point to make or the implication of all this for Christian Muslim relation in Ghana is that if Christians and Muslim clash, it's, it largely has something to do with, this, with state involvement. Now, Christian Muslim relations can be positive and it can be negative. There are moments of cooperation, collaboration, but there are moments also of clash and encounters that are of negative implications. And this can be on theological issues or social, cultural, political, legal issues. In the case of Ghana, you hardly hear of Christians and Muslims clashing on theological issues. So who is Jesus? Who is Mohammed? That can be done by maybe two, three people at the grassroots in their small enclave. But the things that come to the religious and, and to the national and public sphere are issues that have to do with um, encounters in the socio-political space. Be it encounters in public schools where sometimes Muslims feel their minority rights are being violated by Christian schools that are um, being controlled by Christians and vice versa. Or sometime, um, some years back, there was an issue of bringing some Gitmo to returnees into the country and Christians said, no, take them back. The Muslim community say, no, if you do that, you are being Islamophobic. So in, mo in, in, in most of the time, when Christians and Muslims clash, it is something that has something to do with the state. On the other hand, when Christians and Muslims collaborate and they cooperate with each other, it has something to do or something that benefits the state. In Ghana, there are a number of ways that Christians and Muslims have collaborated. We have, for instance, the National Peace Council, which, are, which is the um, statutory organization for promoting peace and also preventing conflict and violence. It is this group and um, this council that resolves major, major political and national disputes. And this council was actually started as an interreligious initiative by Christian and Muslim leaders. Um, to mediate in high profile political issues, especially during elections. But eventually, the state has recognized this as a critical um, institution in building, developing the peace of the country. And so it's been given a legal backing and has now become a legal a statutory organization. So Christians and Muslims collaborating in this area, it is to benefit the, 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 the state. If Christians and Muslims collaborate, and sometimes it is to fight against um, something, for instance, like human sexuality, which they think the state is trying, education, which the state is trying to introduce in the educational system, of which they think the content is not something they can subscribe to. So the state is so critical in the Christ, in Christian Muslim relation in Ghana in the sense that it's the third pillar, it's the third um, pillar in that kind of encounter, or if you like, a triangular relationship, in the sense that if, the, if Christians and Muslims are to have negative encounter or clash, it has something to do with the state and how the state conducts itself. If they are to collaborate, it is something that benefits the general society and by extension, the state as well. So in conclusion, Throughout our slides, you've seen these symbols which are used on the sidelines. And these are what we call Dinkra symbols in um, um, Ghanaian traditional setting. They are symbols that express the ideals and values and um, even the worldview and mindset of, of, of um, some segment of the Ghanaian society. The first one called Jinyame, it expresses the supremacy of God. Ghanaians, both Christians, Muslims, and traditional people, they all believe in God and they as believe in the supremacy of God in such that to the extent that they all prioritize and see God to have um, the final say in things of human affairs, that serves as a point of convergence and a point of collaboration, for instance, among Christians and Muslims. Christians also, uh, Ghanaians also largely believe in unity and diversity. That's where we have several ethnic groups and we are also able to translate this into our religious diversity said that to the extent that we believe in the supremacy of God, we are able to coexist. 
Kobi in Kebi is a third um, um, symbol there, which signifies peace. So nobody should bite the other. Um, of all the things, the debate that may happen, you can be sure that to the large extent, Ghanaians will find a way of living together and also live in harmony. But they also believe in the authority of leadership, believe in the authority of leadership, which moves from our traditional primary setting and extended to the authority of the state. So that even within our religious space, there is some respect and acknowledgement of the authority of the state. So in conclusion, the nature of relationship between Christians and Muslims in Ghana depends largely on the posturing of the state. It has been so in the past and may not be different in the future. Thank you.